Hi and welcome to GMI Hub Online. I'm your host Cheryl Duick and today we're going to be talking about musicianship from the perspective of a keyboardist. But before I for, not forget, um, if this is your first time being on our channel, just hit the like button and subscribe button and that way you'll get to know about all the different uh, shows that we come on have on every Monday morning. But before I continue, I want to introduce my co-hosts, Dale Borland. Dale, are you out there? Absolutely. Hey, I'm so excited about today. We're talking about musicianship. It's going to be really good. And like Cheryl said, we have the GMI Hub online. It's our web uh, website for YouTube. And if you want to check out all the videos we have, get a chance to look at them all. Sorry, my dog is happy to hear you're here as well. So she's barking. Um, you know, uh, this is a great thing about the website that we have, gmihub.ca, is you go on there and you can find some amazing information. Also, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter, which is great. Just drop us your email and every month we'll send you out a free e kind of email kind of thing telling you about our, you know, our monthly updates about the GMI Hub. So we'd love you to take advantage of that. Also, if you happen to be a, a promoter or a musician or an artist who's doing a concert or something, an event that you want us to kind of talk about, you can put that in there as well, the, the hub happenings, and we'll put that in, and we'll give us permission, of course, and we will tell everybody about your event. So we want to help you guys as a community and a service to you. So uh, go to the gmihub.ca and find out more information about that and take advantage of it. Thank you very much. Well, without further ado, we have a special guest today who is a keyboardist, and she's been on here with us before, uh, but we asked her to come back again because... Not only is she going to talk about musicianship, but really talk about it from the perspective of being a good keyboardist. And I like playing on the keys, but one of my questions to her is going to be about the keys to being a good keyboardist ah, in multiple I situations. See you, did there. you like I that see one? You, you like that. it? Yeah, I like it. it? All right. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, the person I'm talking about is Cheryl Dixon Neal. She is an award winning songwriter, keyboardist, she's a music teacher for the Mohawk College, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. she's doing a lot of teaching online as well, so if you're, here's a little plug for her, if you're interested in getting some lessons from her, you know, go to CherylDixonNeal.com, and you can contact her for more details. So, mm -hmm. there's your commercial. <laughs> but Thanks. Cheryl, welcome to GMI Hub Online. Thank you, great to be here again. Awesome. Well, we don't want to waste any time. So let's get into this. Cheryl, I know when we last had you on, we asked you about musicianship. Um, but I'm going to ask you again. Can you remind us of what your definition of musicianship would be? Musicianship covers so many different things. Number one, it covers skill. So knowing your instrument, uh, knowing um, not only the keys and the chords and the, the sight reading and all that, but it also covers how you play it. Uh, I have a, f a famous quote that will probably be on my tombstone one day. It's not what you play, it's how you play it. Uh, because you could have the, the knowledge, but it's all in how you execute that. So musicianship also covers expression, dynamics, playing with uh, feeling. It also covers how you interact with a group setting. So as opposed to a solo setting. In a group setting, it's, uh, it's different. Like you have to be listening to everybody else. You have to tune into what they're doing so that you're not overriding them. And so it covers so many different things to be a good musician overall. So I'm hearing different levels. I'm hearing the actual yeah. skill portion, which is the actual playing and knowing your notes. But there's also another element that you're talking about, which is to do with, call it the relationship around everyone else you're playing with or the relationship with the environment of what you're, or sorry, what you're doing. So example, um, if you're writing a song or if you're performing it, am I correct? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a, uh, I think, a broad term, musicianship. It also mm -hmm. covers, I, I think, 
mu what I like to call musicality. So musicality again is is ha is the expression is uh, is it, it's not just about the notes. Is it musical? Are you creating music? Or are you just creating sound? So creating an experience, musical yeah. experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So how can one develop this musicianship? Uh, first of all, knowing your instrument, like investing time, investing money into lessons. Some people are, are born with, you know, a natural talent to be able to play. But um, I think developing that talent, no matter what gift you're given, God-given gift you're given, I think it's still our responsibility to develop that talent. So lessons, uh, regular practice, and taking performance opportunities, taking those opportunities when they come your way can, you know, like let's say there's a, a recital coming up. For instance, I'm planning a, a recital for my students. So just as, a, as an example, that would be kind of the time for a musician or a music musician or student to step up to the plate and use their skills to to share with others and also having those little t um, dates and little goals uh, kind of puts the fire <laughs> into the butt like oh I have a performance coming up so you're gonna practice more for that and you're going to because you're doing that you're going to become a, a better musician you're going to take that you take it up to the next level Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's the old saying, pressure builds diamonds. So it's kind of <laughs> yeah. like that. You do, you have a, you have a goal set, and you have to be, oh, I got to make sure that happens. Um, taking it to the next level. If you were uh, from a leadership point of view, if you're leading some people in singing, like a corporate worship or something like that, um, is uh, what factors, are, um, core factors, need to be in place for that type of thing? And maybe you can even talk about uh, voice leading as well. Um. Well, voice leading, um, that's actually a different, different thing. Voice leading would be, um, do you mean like in harmony type thing? Keep, that's what I mean well, by just, voice leading. Oh, okay. Because a voice yeah. leading would be um, the, that, that type of thing where someone's in, uh, maybe talk back to the rest of the musicians, tell them to go into the third, fourth chorus, whatever. Uh, but you're talking about uh, something else. Yeah, finding like a common common notes between chords and um, and keeping those notes in common when you're going like from one chord to the next that would be that's a term called voice leading um, that's another uh, another uh, aspect of musicianship another skill that keyboards can learn especially like if you're coming from let's say a classical setting a classical classically trained musician where you're all over the place and now you you're you find yourself, oh, you play piano, so let's have you join the worship team. Well, for a lot of keyboarders, it's like, oh, well, where's the sheet music? Oh, well, there's no sheet music. There's just a chord chart. <laughs> a chord chart, what do I do with that? And so that's when they take their, uh, you know, these triads that you'll learn for many, many years that you think is just part of your technique. That's when you can finally take that technique and put it into practice put it into a song and I find a lot of times people uh, classical performers they've never played with chords so they gravitate to the root position okay which sounds fine when you're like playing a ballad if you're doing like a, you know if just root positions that's great right but let's say you're playing on a worship team and the guitar is already carrying the, the beat uh, sorry, the rhythm. You got a bass player going on. You have the drums. What is a piano player to do at this point? Especially one who is used to playing everything. And now you have to pretty much play hardly anything at all. <laughs> because a lot of times in that setting, you would be playing, you would take a, uh, a sound like a strings. That's where voice leading, voice leading is basically finding the notes that are in common between the two chords and mm. keeping them in the same spot as opposed to, because 
because a violin would not play like that. It wouldn't be right, jumping right. around. So it's a, it's a totally different way of playing when you're playing with a group or playing in a band setting than that, say, you're playing uh, a piano, right. per se. Yeah, yeah there would there'd be like a pad in the background, right? Pad, pad yeah. So call it. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. Hi, when you were saying voice leading, I thought this was going to be a singing lesson after this. <laughs> <laughs> so you just talked about different sounds that are being used, which is kind of cool because I've seen this. Other piano players, and, and I've seen a variety of them, there are some that when they're playing on their own, like you said, Cheryl, they play everything because they're covering they're mm -hmm. like the one person band they're covering the bass they're yeah. covering drums they've got the rhythm and the melody going they're playing a few mm -hmm. harmonies and then they're singing on top of all that right and then um only a few that i've seen were able to do this that as soon as drums come along or a bass guitar or another instrument comes along that the pianist actually adjusts what they're doing from playing everything to kind of going oh well you've got that covered so i'll go play over here and mm -hmm. not every pianist can do that because they're so used to playing everything all over yeah. right yeah uh, go ahead oh um yeah exactly that <laughs> like because if you're playing solo you would and i'll talk about that a little bit later um there's different techniques that you can do to accompany the melody. But when you're playing with a band, the singer's singing the melody. So you want to avoid that. Um, your, your bass player is playing down in this register. So if you can, avoid that register because it would sound too boomy or another thing. So you want to kind of keep it up in this middle C range or higher if you want to cut through. And, um, and, and look for areas of space. So if there's some space and you just have like a little line that you want to kind of, you know, in between the the melody, right. not overpowering the melody. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that key? But you have those little opportunities. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Is it possible like a, for a keyboardist to feel kind of confined if they have a band around them? Um. Yes and no, especially if they're not used to that. Like, um, I know when I first started to play with a band, it was uh, it was very eye-opening, especially when I, when I got my first like gig playing with a professional band. They had already had recordings out, and I don't know what happened to their keyboardist, but they had to find somebody quick, right? And so my friend recommended me, and they said, okay, this is what we want you to play. Uh, for this song, you know, just hold that, hold these two notes and then uh, bring in the little, there's a little effect on that keyboard where it added some vibrato t to the uh, organ sound, you know, and then fade out and then come in and out. And so I felt like I was doing nothing, really. <laughs> I was like, why am I here? <laughs> but then afterwards, you know, people were coming up saying, oh, your, your keyboard is great. I love your new keyboard. I'm thinking, but I'm not doing anything. But less is more. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's where you really have to, again, listen to what everybody else is doing and mm -hmm. decide what you're going to be, what part are you playing? Mm -hmm. You know, this is not a, a one-man show anymore. It's a, yeah. a group setting and we all have one common goal. Yeah. It's, it's not a competition of like, oh, listen, my turn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's recognizing yeah. we're part of the body, not the whole body, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Very true. Well, I also want to talk about the ver different versions of chords. I know you demonstrated a few, but um, you were mentioning before we went online that there are different versions of chords. Can you enlighten us on that? Yes. Um, there's actually what we call different inversions. So I'm gonna, just going to change my camera angle for a second. So this is a C chord. I'll just go back to a piano sound. This is a C chord, which has a C, E, and a G in it. As long as you have a C, an E, and a G, you always have a C chord. Now I'm going to invert it. So if I inverted you right now, you'd be standing on your head. 
So really what invert means is to take the note from the bottom and put it on the, on the top. So this would be still a C chord, but now it's what we call the first inversion. And then I can do it again. So I take that bottom note and put it up on the top. So this would be called the second inversion. So the advantage of knowing different inversions is so that when you're going from one chord to the next, you can find a, a more economical way to get there. So if I was going from a C chord, let's say, to an F chord, if, I, if there was only one way to play that chord, that's a lot of jumping around. And on, again, on piano it might sound okay, but on strings that's going to sound funny. Because a violin would, again, not play like that. It wouldn't be jumping around. So this is where the, the inversions come in handy. If I'm going from a C chord to an F chord, I ask myself, Do, is there any notes in common? Yes, there is. There's a C in common. So instead of me moving my whole hand and coming up to the F, I can keep my thumb where it is and just move these two fingers up. Ta-da! And then it's, I, let's say I'm going from a C to a G chord. Same idea. So here's a G. G, B, D. So there's a G in both the C chord and the G chord. So rather than me moving my whole hand, wherever that common note is, so it's at the top of the chord in this case, I'm going to keep it at the top and I'll move the other notes. So I need a G, B, D. So here's my G, here's my B, here's my D. Ta da So nice and close. And for a string sound, that's going to sound... Oops, sorry. And if you're playing a, a keyboard where it has a string sound or a pad, that kind of thing, you can even just hang on to the notes that you already have and move the ones underneath. Whereas a piano, you have to play it all together again so you can hear them. Right. So a couple little tricks. That, that gives you a smooth transition like a violinist might have. So that's, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I should take some time right now to thank all those who are watching right now for watching. Thank you so much. If you haven't already subscribed, please do and hit the notification bell. And that way you will get notified anytime we upload a video. Um, also, don't forget to check out our website, gmihub.ca. Ihub.ca in the front page and you look down and you'll see some really cool information about us. Also, we have our monthly newsletter. We're talking about our Christmas project, which is coming out. It's, it's out already, but it's uh, something for you to go to GMIHub. Hey, wait a minute, we got a commercial for that. Let's play it. Lewitt presents the LCT441 Flex, a one inch multi pattern microphone with excellent transient response that invites you to experiment. Be flexible, stay creative, choose between eight polar patterns according to your application. Figure of eight super cardioid, cardioid, wide cardioid, omni, reverse wide cardioid. Reverse cardioid, reverse super cardioid. The LCT441 Flex provides pure sound from every perspective. Record vocals and instruments with no technical limitations, thanks to its high dynamic range and low self noise. It comes fully packed and ready to go. Shop mount and magnetic pot filter are already included. Ho, ho, ho! Go to gmihub.bandcamp.com today and get your Christmas Family Volume 2 CD. Who would have thought? Such a good commercial. Are Christmas gifts not enough anymore? Ho, ho, ho. Ho, 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 ho. Ho, 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 ho. So, gmihub.bandcamp.com and download your copy of the album today. And yes, we are using Lua microphones, just so you know. <laughs> yes, yes, just so you know. <laughs> okay, let's bring Cheryl back.
Daryl, where are you? <laughs> there she is. Okay. So, Cheryl, let's learn a little bit more about you as a keyboardist. What was the first keyboard you remember playing? Ah, <sighs> probably my grandmother's piano. My grandmother played piano. She was my inspiration to learn. My mom says that, uh, you know, I saw my grandmother playing and singing, and I went, that's what I want to do. And I was only about maybe five or six at that point. And uh, then I started lessons when I was seven. When I started lessons, uh, I learned on a digital piano until we could get our own. My dad bought my first piano for $25. It was in an old saloon, an old hotel. It had cigarette burns in the keys, and he stripped it. And I refinished it, and I played that baby for 10 years. Yep. Oh, wow. <laughs> and which one do you play now? I didn't see the brand. Um... Well, I have a few here. <laughs> I have a Yamaha digital piano. Uh, it's a Yamaha P... I had a few of them, 255. I have a Roland over there, another digital piano, because I teach, well, now with COVID and social distancing, I teach on one piano, demonstrate, and the students play over there on that, on the other digital piano. I also have a Roland D70, which is from the late 80s, early 90s. It's uh, fully programmable. It, um, it's amazing what you can do with it, but I mean, it's just sitting here <laughs> now. I, because now my, because most of my stuff that I do right now is solo, I find I gravitate to a weighted keyboard, something that feels like a piano. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good point, because I was just about to ask you, are all these keyboards without, um, well, are they all basically the same? But now you just talk about weighted keyboards. That's it. Are weighted keys? That's interesting. Yeah, they're not. Well, the keyboard itself is the same in that you have, you know, two black keys, three black keys, and it repeats itself all throughout the keyboard. It's C, D, E, F, G, A, B. They're all the same. Um, the difference is in the weight. So uh, a lot of 61 note keyboards which is usually what people might start with which is fine uh, they would it would be more like an organ touch an like organ key as opposed to a piano key piano key is thicker and it's usually made out of wood digital pianos they are mostly plastic although there are some now that have a, a natural feel and they'll have that wood in there uh, and so that's what gives it the the weight there's also well in digital pianos there's also different techniques of weighted like there's a graduated weighted it's it's that's another <laughs> topic completely but the big thing is um when you're looking for a keyboard you want to have something that is touch sensitive there are some keyboards that aren't touch sensitive they're more for toys mm -hmm. you know if you're just kind of playing around but if you're really wanting to take lessons like i was talking earlier about playing with dynamics you can't play with dynamics if mm -hmm. with something that is not touch sensitive. Touch sensitive means when you hit it harder, you're going to get a louder tone. When you hit it soft, you'll get a soft tone. Right, so and that, that actually comes from yeah the the acoustic pianos uh, that naturally happens with them. So now that the uh, electronic keyboards are in kind of in the same, uh, I mean, is there a difference now, really? Oh, that's a, a loaded question, actually. Yeah. Is there a difference? <laughs> yeah. Um, yes and no. There is, they have done so much with the digital pianos. Like, they've actually taken samples of, like, nine-foot Bows and Dovers and Yamaha Grands and, whoops, Steinway. And so you're actually getting that same tone. But there's something different. It's not quite the same as sitting down at a nine-foot concert grand piano. You don't get that same. It's like the sound embraces you. <laughs> you know, like it wraps around you. You don't get that same experience, I think. I mean, it's great. Don't get me wrong. It's fantastic. That's what I teach on. But if I were to have like a go-to piano, um, yeah, I'd probably go to a an acoustic grand my favorite is the Yamaha C3. There it's you a, go. A six, yeah, it's my dream piano. 
Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> That's a question that always came up when we first uh, went from analog to digital recording. All the musicians are saying, ah, you lose, you lose so much warmth and so much natural is bad. You know, some people don't notice the difference. And, and I think on a piano, especially if you're in the room, you can really notice the difference between an electronic and, a, and an acoustic piano, for sure. Mm -hmm. But there's advantages to the to digital pianos because, I mean, you don't have oh, to yeah. tune them, right? You can <laughs> control the, the volume a lot better and uh, you can hook them up to your computer and do all kinds of recording. Mm. And so put headphones in, especially if you're learning. <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that's that's a nice good. thing. That's true. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind when I learn piano. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. um, okay. So what about advice for someone who's maybe looking to purchase a piano um, or a keyboard uh, for the first time, like a beginner? What would be something that you would recommend for them to get? Um, well, again, get something that has touch-sensitive keys. Get something that is has the capabilities of operating a pedal, a sustain pedal. Sustain pedal is what holds the notes down. Again, some of the cheaper keyboards don't might not have that uh, feature, so you definitely want that. If you're able to get something with like full 88 notes uh, when you're learning the actual piano, I mean, great. But also I think it depends on the situation. Like if you're, let's say you're, you're learning piano or learning keyboard because you want to play in a band, um, some band keyboardists don't, you don't need the whole keyboard, right? If you're playing with the band and you have the bass player playing and all that, 61 notes is actually a standard size. So I think it depends on your application as well. Yeah. But if you're doing piano, um, if you do have the opportunity to get a full keyboard, go big or go home, why not? But I mean, if you yeah, don't that have sense. that, yeah, if you don't yeah. have that, some people don't have the budget. So... As mm -hmm. long as you have mm -hmm. the 61 notes and um, touch sensitive keys, you're good to go for many years and you can always trade up when you're ready. That's true. Yep. Okay, let's talk about rudiments. Um, what are some rudiments that keyboarders can use to warm up their fingers? I know the last time I had you on, you had kind of the, these kind of exercises, but when they're actually playing, what are some of the rudiments? Technique-wise, yeah. Well, um, we talked earlier about chords. So those triad exercises are, are fantastic. I'm going to actually change my camera angle again so you can see. There's a few little uh, finger exercises I can show you. Okay. One popular one is what's called the hand and exercise which targets these weaker fingers so you're going like I'll do the left hand so that just gets every finger going another exercise that I actually like to teach beginners is it's called a pentascale where you're just playing five notes and then you take the first note third note fifth note of those of that scale and voila you have your chord so if you go through those through the keyboard and play all these pentascales there's your C sharp chord there's your D chord so this exercise is really good because it's number one a finger exercise number two it's teaching you the chords every chord and uh, number three it's an ear training exercise so you're taking that same sound do re mi fa so and you're moving it up the keyboard and finding that same sound up the keyboard so it's again three things finger dexterity the ear and also it's teaching you the chords. So that, that first exercise that you were doing, were you playing every note or were you skipping notes with all the I was fingers? skipping one. So skipping one, walking up, walking down. Skip. The 
Because this is usually the weakest link of the hand, right? Because you can easily do this. You can do this. You can do that. You try to do that with your fourth finger. No, nope, not so much. And that's the way the good Lord made us. And there was one composer. I believe it was uh, Schumann. Now, for, forgive me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I get the Schu Schuberts and Schumann mixed up. But anyways, he thought that uh, something was wrong with his finger. So he actually tied a string to it and slept with it standing straight up and damaged all the nerves in his arms and couldn't play. So don't do that. There's nothing wrong with that finger. But this particular exercise just helps us strengthen that five and four. But you again, you also want to move as you go. That's That exercise is part of a whole book of exercise called the Hannon Exercises. And there's, uh, there's probably about 20, 30 or more exercises in that book that target different areas of the hand, like five, finger five and four, finger four and three. There's another one that's, sorry. This is a good one. This works on rotation. Sounds like the and then there's the also the box song. <laughs> Oh, yes. Bach uses that, that little technique in there a lot. Then there's also like the full scale. So that that is teaching you what's in the key. So if somebody says, oh, we're playing in the key of G, by doing your scales, you're not only warming up your fingertips, but you're also you're also learning what is in that key, what sharps and flats are in that key. Then the other technique is those, the triads I was talking about earlier, where you're, where you're working on root position, first inversion, second inversion. Root. That just gives you the basics of, of how to play those chords. And then I have actually another little um, technique that I, sorry, a chord progression that I created for students where they're going from like the C chord to the F chord, C chord, G chord, C, F, G, and now from here we'll go to our closest C. And then we go around that same sequence again. C, F, C. Really makes you think. G, C, F. From here I'm going to go to this G, and from this G I'm going to go to this C. And then I do that same thing go around again. F, C, G, C, F, pick it up, and I'm back home. Now I've applied those triads and inversions to a what's called a chord progression. And that you would use in the middle of a song. You in the middle of a song you could decide what would be my most economical, as my former teacher used to say, my most economical inversion that I could go to, as opposed to jumping around. So there's a few little tips there. Wonderful. Okay, so now people to play um, different styles of music. Um, and I know that you have experience playing different styles of music. These rudiments are obviously very helpful, and some of them, like I mentioned, almost come across uh, classical, like Bach was there, right? Yeah. Um, but what if it's a jazz feel or country feel? Would the, would the keyboard techniques be different and the rudiments be different to practice? Um, yes and no. Um, I think the technique, like the scales, still, they cross over any genre because you're playing in those keys, whether you're playing country or classical or jazz. So that is a, that's a given, that doing your scales and your triads. When you're learning jazz, you're getting into more seventh chords, which are four note chords. And there's different types of seventh chords. There's like major seven chords, dominant seven chords, minor sevenths. And then uh, also, I mean, then there's extensions on top of that. There's ninths and there's... 11th and so it's a big uh, five fingers though <laughs> I know but that's when you get playing you know 
two-handed chords where you're catching some of those notes in your left and some of them in your right. So that's quite a different technique altogether. And when you're playing jazz, um, you're doing what's called a lot of comping. So like, um, whereas the, ba the bass player is playing, it would be playing like, let's say, a walking. So it's doing that. So I don't have to do that on the piano. So I can actually, many times, you're not even playing the root of the chord. In order to be able to catch some of those other tensions, we call them, like ninths and elevenths and thirteenths, you don't have time. You don't have a, enough fingers to catch the root. And the bass player has the root, so you can leave that out. So they, yeah, that is a different technique when you're, when you're playing jazz. When you're playing classical, and again, you know what? Classical, actually, that's just a very broad term, kind of like rock. In rock, you have so many different types of rock. In classical, you, mm -hmm. you have your, well, classical it specifically is a certain time period of where Mozart and uh, early Beethoven Later, Beethoven's more into the Romantic period. So, but classical is that era. But we tend to group Baroque, classical, uh, Romantic, and Impressionistic. We tend to kind of group that into that classical blanket. But there's still a lot of uh, characteristics of those eras. But technique-wise, I mean, you're still working on the scales that Hannon. A lot of fast finger dexterity is required for the the classical music. In jazz, you have more of uh, more stretches, actually. More, yeah. It's just a, it's different. Anyways, <laughs> could go on forever. Oh, penis too. That's, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, I I just learned something. That's so cool. <laughs> okay. Oh, great. So Dale has a piano behind him. So what he's gonna do when he gets off this live, he's gonna play all these little Hannon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, in your opinion, are keys the best way to? I'm going back to musicianship now. Or being a keyboardist, is that the best way to start learning about musicianship? In your opinion. I think that, yeah, learning the keyboard is the, the best instrument to start on because you're learning both the treble and the bass. If you're learning a trumpet, you're just learning the treble clef. If you're learning, let's say, a tuba, you're learning the bass clef. And uh, the piano, you're learning both the treble and the bass. So you're, you can apply that skill to learning any other instrument. Actually, as a matter of fact, if, when you go to school for music, uh, so I, I went, I mean, ma piano was my major, but when other people came in, let's say they played the clarinet, they still had to take the piano because all the harmony and theory that we learned was applied to the piano. Like when you're building chords, you can't build a chord on a clarinet unless you have a few of them, <laughs> right? So learning the piano gives you that foundation that you can apply to mm -hmm. learning any other instrument. Even, mm -hmm. even drums, and because piano in itself is a percussive instrument, but um, I know from being a drummer that you can, uh, piano is the best way to start uh, to learn how to do drums, especially when it comes to sheet music, because you'll learn your quarter notes, your eighth notes, your sixteenth notes, your paradiddles, and all those types of things through the piano understanding of notes. Yes. Um, true, yes. Actually, well, a lot of, uh, a lot of drummers, unfortunately, had, had to, they struggle through the theory part of it, because you mm -hmm. don't have, you, is, even though it's, you know, you're learning, drum music's different than, let's say, yeah, uh, music on the staff, yeah, yeah. So, it's like a different, it's almost a different language. But, yeah. but... Yeah. They do try to learn to um, tune their toms and their different things mm -hmm. so it does, so that when they're doing their um, fills or, I wasn't say their chords, <laughs> but when they <laughs> do their fills, it'll, it's almost like they're playing chords while they're playing their toms. 
for the notations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a certain tone that's expected of a certain drum size. Yeah. 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 Especially in classical music too, like the timpanis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, timpanis. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I know all about that. Oh, yes, remember that back, back in my high school, high school days. Boom, boom, <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> Oh, you played wow. the timpanis? I yeah, was back in high school. Yeah, Cheryl oh, is the drummer. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. 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 I was a percussionist. I actually went to school to learn. I was in high school, and my instrument of choice was drums, but I was the only female drummer. And while I was learning the set, which is what I wanted to learn, um, I was the only one in the class that was willing to try everything else. So I ended up being more the percussionist, learning the everything from bells to exylophone to mm -hmm. play the triangle to the timpani to bongos mm -hmm. to congos. So I ended up being a well-rounded percussionist and drummer. In the but it's yeah. been a long time. <laughs> I'm but sure. You mentioned, were... you mentioned the xyloph You mentioned the xylophone. It's interesting because again, piano. Is, is the same as a xylophone and it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah so it's one of those things I think a basic understanding of piano really will help uh, with any any instrument yeah that explains so then why does school start with Ricardo hmm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's well, true I it's... taught recorder I did that that's true um, it's probably because it's a little easier to learn right it's more portable <laughs> yeah it's just i think it's that's the reason because you can hand them all out and make sure each kid gets their own and it's absolutely uh, <laughs> yeah can you imagine like a whole class having piano yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, my yeah. Goodness. <laughs> and now bring out your pianos <laughs> <laughs> Well, everyone, if you're just tuning in you're watching gmi hub online we are talking with cheryl dixon neil about keys and about being a musician and musicianship um, if you like what you're hearing and you're learning a lot smash the like button smash the subscription button so that you can be aware of anytime we put new episodes on GMI Hub online we usually have one every Monday except on holidays so um, other than that, if you want to know more about GMI Hub online, go to our website, gmihub.ca, where you learn more about the different projects that we do. The um, You'll learn about our, our email uh, newsletter. Gail, help me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our Hub Happenings comes out once a month, and it's Thank something you. that you don't want to miss. If you go to gmihub.ca, and uh, you'll see Hub Happenings right there. Send us your email, and that way we can make sure you get that every month. Yes. And um, we did mention that we have a Christmas compilation album that has come out. Guys, you have to listen to this. You have to get a copy. I mean, I normally don't push like that, but the artists on here are so good, mm, and the mm. music is so cool. <laughs> it's like, you've got to get a copy of it. Just go to gmihub.bandcamp.com, and you can hear all the songs. And it's not just, uh, it's artists right across Canada. I mean, it's, well, a lot in Alberta. There's some in Ontario. And even a few weeks ago, we did the East to West virtual tour. If you want to hear them even perform their their song, go to that episode in particular, and you'll get to see them face to face. Well, sort of face to face, <laughs> face to screen, <laughs> and you can hear them perform their song. And these are original songs that they wrote mm -hmm. for this purpose. And I love what um, one one of the artists mentioned. His name was David Cole. And he wrote a song called Simply Christmas. And he said, you know, he's, it's a crazy time of year, especially in his position uh, as a music, um, well, he's a music director at our church. Or, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's the right term. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's usually a busy time of year, but he really wanted to reflect on the true meaning of Christmas. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he wouldn't have written a song without being, I'll say, 
pushed a little bit mm-hmm. <laughs> or encouraged a little bit <laughs> yeah. with the deadline of mm-hmm. writing a song for GMI Hub's Christmas compilation. So, David, thank mm-hmm. you so much for doing that. And not just for you, but FAC yeah. and all the other artists mm-hmm. that have participated in that. And, um, and everyone else that's listening to this, you've got to get a copy and just yeah. listen to them. Listen to these songs, yeah. purchase a copy, and support these artists. I mean, yeah, they put their absolutely. heart and soul in all of that. So, and they're Canadian, <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. and they really are good songs. I mean, I, I, I listen to them and go, Man, what quality! Great musicianship, amazing singers. It's, it's really good. It is. There's one in it, particular, there's one in particular that's <laughs> that will get you moving. Yeah, we'll get you kind of dancing and uh, enjoying the groove. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. It what makes you want to get be? my bells out. <laughs> yes, makes you makes you want to ring those bells. Oh, yeah. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> so, uh, let's get Cheryl back in here. Cheryl, one more question for you. In your opinion, what are the keys to becoming an excellent keyboardist? I was waiting for that question. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> what are the keys? Get it? Yeah. 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 Well, knowing the keys, oh. <laughs> that's the first step. Uh, keys to becoming an excellent pianist. Well, uh, regular practice. And again, I know that's, uh, I think the hardest part is actually getting to the bench. Right? Once you get there, you can, you can um, really get a lot accomplished. I actually... I actually encourage people to try to set like an appointment with themselves because I find every student shows up on time, they're here, but they're not always prepared. Um, and I say, you're here, like you're, you come on time, S- give yourself an appointment every day. Um, and it doesn't, it, you know, it's not about the length of time as per se as the consistency and, and also how you practice. If you're pressed for time, there's a, a lot of really good practice techniques where you can like find mm-hmm. find the parts of the piece that exceptionally need attention rather than starting at the beginning every time. Um, that's, uh, that's a whole other thing. But uh, yeah, that's a great tip actually because many times people, they are playing through from the beginning and then they always, every song has a spot and they get stuck, you know, mm-hmm. and what do they what do we do we start again no because when we start again that actually doesn't fix that spot and you may not even realize it but now you you've started again about three four times and now you're getting faster and faster and so now you get to that part and it's sticky and so it it's choppy you'll find that oh gee i'm practicing but i'm not getting any better why is this not helping well, how are we practicing? Because there's a, a saying that says practice makes perfect, but you know what? Mm-hmm. Practice makes permanent. <gasps> what? Ooh. So if you're practicing, Ooh. yeah, like if that. you're practicing, um, that wasn't mine actually. I got that from a, a vocal teacher. Um, but if you're practicing the same mistake, it's going to be there waiting for you the next day. So you almost have to like trick yourself. Don't start at the beginning. Don't tell your brain, that, oh, this is such and such a song because your fingers will be like, oh, okay, I know. And they'll just go to where they're going and it might not be where you want them to. <laughs> so take that chunk and just play that part over and over mm-hmm. until it feels good. And then take it from like the, maybe the bar before and then come into that part. Another practice tip would be to take uh, the bar because that's another thing that people um, do sometimes we see those bar lines in the music and we almost think they're like stop signs we play the bar and there's pause bar pause okay that's not good musicianship that's very choppy you want to flow so one thing you can do is like play that bar and then the note right after it so it's that's called playing over the bar line and that just gets you used to not stopping just continuing that flow so yeah, mm. practicing, but not just practicing, practicing the parts that especially need attention. Another thing is uh, starting at the end of the piece. Many times, what, what do people remember, the beginning or the end in the performance? Mm. The end, we don't remember the beginning. So if you get the ending down 
And also, you can practice it backwards, like practice that wow. that ending part, and then um, go to the next part before that. Play that part. Play that into the ending. Go to the next part before that. See what I'm doing? So the ending is getting played every single time. So by the time you learn the whole song, you can still chunk it. But if you start at the bottom of the song, then the whole song is getting played. And by the time you finish the song, you've got a great ending. And that's what had, people remember. I just had visions of songs with big endings and going, da 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 you know? yeah. <laughs> And being able to do that every single time. That sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Really I love what you just tips. said there, because you're talking about working through the hard parts. It's like, you're, you, um, it's like, uh, it just reminded me of woodworking whenever you're sanding something down you don't you don't do the parts that's already been done like you go to the part you need to work on that that's that's really good and practice the ending first that i never even thought of that I, i've done that without even thinking but it's it, it makes sense because you want to know how like when you're writing a book you have a an intro a, a censure a middle and, and then the ending but you want to you want to guide to the ending you want to direct mm -hmm. the story towards the ending. So the ending is almost vital to the rest of the construction of the story. So it's uh, it's very true when it comes to songwriting. Wow, that's that's a really good a nugget of information. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and they say that about a good book. You read the ending first. Hmm. <laughs> well, well, this has been awesome absolutely awesome yeah. cheryl thank you so so much for sharing for coming back and sharing all this wisdom about keys keyboarding rudiments i've got to learn how to do that hand hansel exercise <laughs> hannon 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 yeah <laughs> yes h-a-n-o-n h-a-n he was a composer ah i have to mm -hmm. learn and you said there was a book about about that exercises about 30 different exercises that people yes do? yeah the yeah. hand and finger exercises ah can we get that online Maybe look uh, that up? i'm sure you can okay we'll look that yeah. up so for all you keyboardists out there i hope you've learned something for all you want to be keyboardists i hope you've learned something uh, for all those non-keyboarders i've heard i hope you learn a lot about what keyboarders um have to practice and what they're doing what they have to learn so that they can better support you whether you're mm -hmm. singing or playing another instrument in a band um thank you guys so much for joining us this is gmi hub online i'm cheryl duick with Dill Borland and our special hey. guest Cheryl Dixon Neal. Um, we want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I won't say Happy New Year yet, but Happy New Year in case you're watching it later on. <laughs> <laughs> you just said it. I know. Oh well. <laughs> and remember that GMI Hub is here to encourage unity, community, mentorship, and talent growth within the gospel music community and with that good night good night